Today, we're going to look at the work of a designer and artist called Julian Opie. You're going to be using his work to influence some digital illustration work that you create. This is an image created by Julian Opie and it's a series of portraits of the band Blur. This was used on their Best Of album. You can see that it's got similar characteristics to the image on the first slide. It's got flat colours, it's got these bold outlines, it's got the simplification, it's got bright colours. These are many of the characteristics that Julian Opie has throughout his work. One of the reasons I find this image particularly interesting is because for me it really challenges the boundary between art and graphic design as much of Opie's work does. This original version was created um, initially as a series of portraits which were then adapted for a CD cover or a vinyl cover but the work interestingly appears in another context which you might not be expecting. So the image on the left is the portraits being hung in the National Portrait Gallery in London. I've deliberately inc included an image um, with someone putting the portraits on the wall to show you the scale of the portraits when they were displayed in a gallery. For me, this raises a lot of questions. I don't think we typically expect to see digital work in the National Portrait Gallery, but of course many of the artists who do feature in the National Portrait Gallery didn't have access to a computer. Maybe if they did, their work would have ended up being more similar to contemporary artists such as Opie. I think this really challenges boundaries between art and design because despite being essentially the same image, the different context that the work is used in makes you think about it in a very different way. On the right hand side you can see the uh, images as an album sleeve with a record popping out. It was used for a record and for a CD. Obviously a record is 12 inches square. You can see by the man hanging the portraits in the portrait gallery, gallery those images are much bigger than the original CD or the original vinyl. There are some other significant differences. When you see them in the portrait gallery, obviously they're in the context of other pieces of art. They're observed as one-off and valuable pieces of work. When you're working digitally, like Julian Opie does, obviously you have the opportunity to mass produce the work, but he limits the amount of um, pieces of art that he puts in a gallery context. Sometimes you can buy up to 25 or 50, perhaps, of a particular print, Sometimes he will limit it even lower than that to retain the value as a piece of art. Obviously, these pieces of work have got this cultural context now. They're in the gallery. They're important people. Uh, Blur are widely recognised as one of the most established and important British bands of their generation. The CD, however, is much more throwaway. CDs are incredibly cheap now. You could buy the best of Blur on CD for next to nothing. On vinyl it's a little bit more expensive, but there's a, a huge difference between how many copies of a CD or a vinyl are produced compared to the images in the National Portrait Gallery. That album has sold many, many copies and many, many people will have it in their home. It's seen as a much more commercial and throwaway item than the fine art pieces. And this is something I find particularly interesting when it comes to analysing what the differences between art and graphics are these days and how those boundaries are increasingly narrow. Of course, many contemporary artists do want to use digital work and do want to use computers to make their work. In terms of the actual content of the work, I think it's particularly interesting that you can tell which member of Blur is if you have any understanding of who is in the band, if you've seen their photographs or perhaps seen them at a gig. They've got recognisable features such as the glasses, the hairstyles. Opie continues to use this very flat imagery, this very um, bold outline technique and the bright colours that are consistent with most of his work. But the detail in the hair, the detail in some of the features, earrings, etc., make you know that this person is a particular member of the band. It's easy, easy to differentiate between the members. Opie consistently uses generic shapes and in all of his portrait work you'll see that he uses dots for eyes and small mouths and that is consistent across all of his work. This idea of a generic shape I think is something that Opie is consistently interested in. 
So where did the relationship between an artist, Julian Opie, and a band like Blur come from? You may recognise the artist who made this piece of work. This is another Blur album cover. It is by Banksy. Blur consistently wanted to involve themselves in the art world. They had connections to art school. They were interested in art. They felt, I think, that connecting themselves with artists give their music a little bit more credibility. So Banksy was keen to work with Blur. Blur were very much part of a cultural revolution in the 90s musically. They were part of a movement called Britpop, but they were also part of a movement called Cool Britannia, a play on Rule Britannia. This included bands such as Blur, such as Oasis, and even the Spice Girls were um, considered to be part of the Cool Britannia movement. So artists who were becoming established at that time, such as Banksy, were keen to be involved in that music world. And of course, Blur were keen to be involved with the artist. A graphic design company Blur worked with extensively was Stylo Rouge. These are some designs by Stylo Rouge. Um, one is for a, um, a gig at Hyde Park, and another is a series of stamps which feature Blur art that was created by Stylo Rouge. So Stylo Rouge are a design company we will look at in more detail later in the course, but their relationship with Blur is, was prominent for many years. Stylo Rouge were also a key part of 90s British culture. They designed the distinctive artwork for the train spotting films, for example. Blur were also um, interested in fine art and managed to work with perhaps the most famous artist of that period, Damien Hirst. So here's a Blur song and a music video that was actually directed by the famous artist Damien Hirst. So you can hear what they sound like and also see the distinctive imagery that they use in all of their marketing. If you want to see some more of Damien Hirst's work, this is his website, DamienHirst.com. He was famous for cutting a cow in half. We'll come back to that. So make of that music what you will. Blur were particularly famous in the 90s, but are still popular now. And their singer, Damon Albarn, um, is known for the band Gorillaz, which some of you may have come across, and um, perhaps more relevant to people of your age. I imagine you will recognise these images. The artwork is no longer there, but these images are from Selfridges in Manchester City Centre. Julian Opie worked extensively with Selfridges to develop this range of images. His idea of repeated characters walking um, is something that's consistent with a, lo a lot of his work. You will see, again, this idea of generic shapes. Most people do not have a circle floating above them for a head, but this is something that is distinctive and characteristic of Opie's work. When I look at these images, I think they really portray the idea of, of being in a busy shopping area to me. When I walk around a busy shopping area, I'm very preoccupied with what I'm trying to do. People look almost like a mass of generic shapes. I don't tend to notice what people look like, what they're wearing. I wouldn't be able to recall who I'd seen, what people looked like in that mass crowd. And I think this comes across very nicely in Opie's work. I think you can see this idea of a busy shopping centre. I think it conveys that idea of generic people that you walk past, perhaps not really paying attention to. This um, idea of a generic image that is repeated is very much portrayed in the Imagine You Are Driving series. So this was on the first slide. For me, this has a lot of connections with the sort of computer games I played as a child before graphics were very sophisticated. They were very simplified and there was often a repeated screen that you followed around and you could almost imagine you are driving. I think it's quite interesting as well, the lack of detail in your surroundings. Of course, when you're driving down the motorway, you should probably be concentrating on the road. But around you, there's not just a green field. There's a lot more detail. But very often, if you were asked to recall what you drove past, you wouldn't be able to remember in any great detail what that, um, those things you saw were and how detailed the landscape was. So I think this idea of repeated generic shapes 
makes a lot of connections with how people perhaps don't pay attention to a lot of detail to things around them in their everyday life. So that's some of the stuff I take from Julian Opie's work. Of course, as always, we want you to think about what you make of the work. And to do that, we'd like you to do a little bit more research about Opie's work. On here, there are some links to some websites where you can get more information that you can use in your critical links. So if we click on these links, the National Portrait Gallery has a lot of information about the Blur work. And you can see um, when it was uh, made, how it was made, and some general information about the National Portrait Gallery as well, which is an excellent gallery. Styler Rouge has a big section in their portfolio on their site about, about Blur and the work they did with Blur. So you can have a closer look at that. I think a lot of you will be really interested in the work of Styler Rouge. It's certainly worth checking out in more detail. And their connection with Blur was um, a pivotal part of 90s culture. And we also have some stuff from the Tate Gallery, one of the best galleries in the world, in my opinion. Um, so the Imagine You Were Driving series, and there's lots of information from the Tate where they talk about the work in more detail. And the Tate Gallery is also an excellent um, website where you can look at lots of interesting art. And of course, when you can go to the Tate, you should certainly try and do so. One of the things we want you to take from this work is this idea of digital illustration. So for me, the way in which Julian Opie works is a way of drawing. And that connects back to what we traditionally think of as fine art, the idea of drawing and painting. So I like the idea of seeing Opie's work as a digital drawing, a drawing that you generate on a computer. But obviously, he creates these vector images which you will associate with contemporary graphic design as well. So we're going to have a, an attempt in lessons to do some drawings based on Opie's work. You'll be able to see from one of the films I'm about to show you that that's something Opie very much encourages. In fact, in one of his exhibitions, he also he had a screen where people could make their own portraits by tracing over their images. Whilst I'm... Um, you can take um, information from me about Opie's work and um, hopefully it's interesting and informative. It's never going to be as interesting as hearing Opie talk about his work himself. So for the latter part of this presentation, I have two films which are Julian Opie talking about his work. I'll post the links to these so you can go back to them at a later date. It's very exciting at my stage in life to be working on projects all over the world. Um, on our website we've actually got a map with little points of all, where all the things that you can see over the world and I playfully suggest that I'm trying for world domination. Making art is, I think, a way of doing something about existing and I can't imagine a life where things just washed over you and you weren't able to do something with it all because it's so exciting uh, and vibrant to be alive each day. Making work is a way of, of drawing the world and a little bit like drawing water out of a well is a way of taking the world in and producing something with it and a way of picturing the world, a way of engaging with the world and I've done that ever since I was a kid. And if you think about drawing, you know, early humans, even before perhaps the first drawing was made, might have glanced down and seen their shadow or seen a reflection in water. If you look at cave drawings, blowing um, ochre over your hand and then taking your hand away and seeing the outline of your hand is a drawing. And these portraits that are here are very similar in a sense to the hand ochre process. Instead of using the hand, I'm using the face. It's simply a process of drawing a line over the perceived lines that I see of a face. People often ask about, you know, who is the work directed to or what is it that you'd like to say to people? And to be absolutely honest, I really don't think about other people that much. I'm mostly engaged in myself and my family and my studio and my work. It's not like I sit there thinking, oh, what are people going to respond to? 
I use myself as the litmus test for all of that. If I think it's working, then I can only hope and assume that it's working for other people. Before I drew animals, I drew buildings. And while I was in the process of drawing buildings, I had my first child. And my child started playing with some toys I bought back from Vienna, uh, animals that were cut out of solid pieces of wood. And I really enjoyed these animals because they seemed both a drawing and an object. And I loved watching the way that my daughter would move these little bits of wood around. But in her mind and in mine, they were on a farm, on a field, and the carpet became a field. And I thought, it's amazing how those little bits of wood with that simple cut-out design can turn the entire carpet into a field. And that seemed like a very sculptural kind of uh, statement to me. So I set about making sculptures of cut-out um, sheep and cows and dogs. I couldn't find a sense of a similar cut-outness of, of people. It didn't seem to exist as an image so much. And it was only really when I came to start looking at signs and symbols, road signs, particularly lavatory male and female signs, that I saw that there was what we'd now call emoji or a hieroglyphic for the human form. I'm not an architect, I'm an artist, so I only make pictures. But it's my job to somehow animate and uh, make this space feel exciting beyond just the individual works. So it's got to be more than the sum of its parts, as it were. Making a picture, making an artwork, making something to look at, it's a bit like cooking in a way. You've got a lot of ingredients and it's all to do with how you put them together. And I delve into this, I experiment and cook with it by making things. This is a portrait of someone called Lucia. This idea of someone refusing to have their portrait made is something that interests me, someone refusing your gaze. So a little bit more like you're in the queue behind that person and you're sort of wondering about them, but you don't actually get to see their face. I mean, I came across the turned head by accident because I was drawing people on the street and quite often they would turn their head away. And there's something kind of interesting about that, that difference in that relationship to this relationship. It's a very, very different one. So I found that these pictures of people on the street where their heads were turned away as they were looking at their phone mostly had a real melancholic drama to them, much more than when the, you were looking at the face. And in fact, I didn't really want to draw the features of the face at that stage. The line here is so thick that I can barely manage the ear. So by turning the head away, it both solves the problem of having to deal with the features, um, but also introduces this sort of negative, melancholic um, dynamic. And when I was asked to make this exhibition with uh, the fantastic Van Dyke painting, which has got an, a very strong twist in the pose, that felt good. There's, there's all this history of the turning shoulders and the turning head and what that indicates and means and how that, how that affects the relationship between both the artist, the sitter, and the viewer. So when you look at the Van Dyke, you know that it's him. He's painted himself, so that's different again. And you also know that he has turned towards you. So there's a sense of, of meeting and of, of dynamic and surprise, which is exciting. George is an American interior designer, and he and his boyfriend wanted a portrait made of him. He was actually very shy. I don't know whether that comes across a certain kind of reticence. He had fantastic glasses, and the, the reflections and the movement of those glasses um, just was like a golden opportunity. And the timing for me is, is kind of important. The fact that he, he stops in between each movement. I have tried films where the movement's continuous, and then he appears to see saying no, and just... Um, and it's awkward and slightly distressing to watch. So by making him stop gives you a sense that really this is a picture that's still, and then it changes to another one that is still. This guy uh, is walking down the streets of Seoul uh, about four years ago, maybe, and I've been asked to make an exhibition in Seoul. So I had a photographer in Seoul stand with a camera on a street corner and simply snap away for hours and received hundreds of photographs. So this is the opposite, in a sense, of the the commissioned portrait. When you look at a commissioned portrait, it feels a certain way. You can sort of feel that relationship embedded in the whole process. But when you look at a portrait of someone on the street, that's completely gone. There's no sense of me as an artist knowing this person. 
There's no intimacy. So you're a voyeur looking at him in a certain way. But there's something kind of positive that you feel. I, I cycle to and from work, and when you have to stop and wait, you know, I watch the crowds crisscrossing in front of me in between the traffic. And just that sense of busyness and that kind of dynamic dance of all these strangers that you see for a, a moment and then disappear. And then there's another set. And as far as I'm concerned, I could carry on and draw everybody. But as it is, I'm taking samples, obviously. I have been drawing people for quite a long time, and I've drawn an awful lot of them, and I don't fully understand that. Sometimes I react against it. You know, like I'll come back from holiday and think, ah, enough, all these people. You know, and surely I could be doing some things with, with other elements. It doesn't really matter. I mean, behind you, we've got some, some works using architecture. Of course, it changes the game. But it's refreshing to have this different material, and it allows for different scales and different references and a whole different exhibitions to come out of it. But there is something about people. It's such a big part of life, and it's so dynamic and strong that it's, it's something that I seem to kind of keep coming back to, and clearly I'm not the only one. Um, and therefore that allows me this very rich uh, art historical set of references both to refer to and to learn from. This is Maria. I was making uh, images that were very strongly related to art historical sources in a way that you know, there was no question when you look at that, that that's where it's coming from. I was very clear about the references in terms of the, the pose, the dress, the format, the composition, the fact that he's got this kind of uh, landscape with her house in the background and the, the dappled light, very, very much coming from Joshua Reynolds, who is a great influence and hero of mine, and, and also you know, it's interesting that Joshua Reynolds is often placed in, in relation to Van Dyck, and I've kind of related back to that. When I drew her, I had drawings and scans of, of paintings by those people lying in front of myself and the photographer, and we, we asked uh, Maria to take up those pose, very specific poses, that the, the look away to the sky was taken from there. You'll notice every now and then a, a figure turns up in the window to look in. I mean, that's not taken specifically from anywhere, but it seemed to come from from that, that idea that in the background there will be something that is related to the figure. So that, that kind of narrative relationship um, both offered me something to draw, something to animate, and a way of keying in that reference. So there's a whole bunch of things that are moving here. Um, but the idea really was just to kind of try to force the still image into a sense of presence and the here and now. Computer uh, drawing tends to work a lot in layers as old master paintings used to do. So you do, you do layers of drawing and layers of glazing, and each one would build up and make it seem more uh, ephemeral, more deep, more intangible as to how it actually got created. But I felt in this case, this sort of obfuscation and, and not allowing your brain to ever really be able to figure out quite what's going on, it works. Art gets looked at in art galleries and museums and treated as art. and. You can ignore that and just make things and then let that process happen. Or you can try to take responsibility for the way in which an artwork is read and what it will be read as in, in the biggest sense that you can understand at the time. And that's what I try to do. So the fact that you're looking at an artwork and you know it's an artwork and you know that I must be on a certain level of an artist to be showing in this space and you know that it's got a certain value and you know that it's made of a certain thing that will last for us. All of those things are rushing through your head at the same time as taking on the colours, the movement, the technology, the height on the wall. You know, that, that is the reality of the artwork in, in its broadest sense and that's what I'm dealing with and I'm trying to get all of that to provide as powerful an engine for that work as I can manage. Showing next to Van Dyck doesn't make me nervous, although it should. I feel excited about doing it because it's such a great artwork and it's it's so dynamic, so alive, the, the Van Dyck self-portrait, that that it sort of just puts you in a good mood. So I think a good receptive mood. People have said to me on occasion, and it's the nicest thing, that after they've been to see my exhibition, when they go out on the street, they notice things. I think that's totally fantastic. So certainly that's how it works for me, that when I'm kind of feeling like I'm able to draw, when I am drawing, when I'm engaged in that, the world kind of comes to life more for me. That's the whole process, is it coming alive, doing something with it, back and back and forth. So if it can do that for someone else, 
great. And for me, going to an art gallery and seeing an artwork that's good, it does that for me. It makes me feel alive. It makes me feel excited and animated. It makes me notice everything else in the world.